Now we are going to start the second part of uh, this session, which will be three shorter talks, half an hour each, including questions, if we manage to stay on schedule. And it would be good because we have some interesting uh, things happening after this session. So uh, the three talks will be uh, given by uh, local colleagues uh, involved in the Institute. The first one is uh, James Crowley, who could not come here uh, today. Um, probably most of you know him, and I don't need to, to introduce him. He's uh, currently Professor Emeritus, Professor Emerit, uh, uh, an Institut Polytechnique de Grenoble. So he's uh, at MEAE, he's involved in the chair on uh, collaborative intelligence systems. And he's also involved in the humane AI uh, network, which is a Euro European network on human-centered artificial intelligence. And for a, a little bit about the backstory of the organization of this session, um, he, he told us that he didn't agree uh, completely with uh, Fosca on explainable AI, and we thought that it could be interesting to have then maybe a, a different uh, opinion on this topic, although it's not the exact topic of the, his talk. Uh, which will be on a hierarchical framework for collaborative AI. James? Uh, we can't yes, hear you. I'm ready to share my screen. Can you hold on just a second? You should see my screen now. Yes, very good. Uh, no, not very good. It's sharing the wrong screen. Hold on. So this is where it's supposed to share. Yes, there we go. All right. And um, if it's okay, I'd like to record this. I uh, assume no one has any objections. Are you on? Well, okay, so I have to ask the permission to record. Okay, well, if, if, if the uh, organizers could record, that would be good. Otherwise, it's not, it's not essential. And um, let, me, let me start by saying I'm very sorry not to be with you. Um, I've been relaxing my um, protocols against COVID this year, and, and it's very good. I was looking forward to being physically present, and maybe we relaxed a little bit too much because then I tested positive last week. So um, I'm doing this remotely to protect you all. Um, so yes, I, I proposed a title, Hierarchical Framework for Collaborative Intelligence Systems, because this is something I'd wanted to tell my colleagues at MIAI about for some time, but, but in fact, um, an alternative title might well have been Comprehensive Comprehension, Explanation, and Learning Core Research Challenges for Collaborative AI. And, and I thought this would be interesting, especially because of the take I'm going to present on explanation. And let me say that it's not that I disagree with Fosca about explanation. We're having a dialogue. We've been having discussions for, through a series of meetings about what, what it means to explain and what, what the nature of explainable AI is. And I'm going to present a view which I think is somewhat broader and more general than what the explainable AI community is looking at today. It goes beyond simply explaining a decision to, to really explaining understanding. Okay. Um, this is work that has grown out of AI for you, um, where, we, where I worked with Fosca, in fact, um, and the, in particular the AI for you working group on collaborative AI and is now being continued under Humane AI Net. I'll explain that a little bit as we go on. Um, I, the talk should take only 20 minutes. Um, I have three parts. Uh, a quick ex explanation or description of the taxonomy for collaborative systems that's been developed in ai for You working group on collaborative AI. Um, as a background for proposing three core research challenges for collaborative AI um, on comprehension, explanation, and adaptation, uh, a form of learning, or I could call it adaptive learning. And I'll explain all those in just a minute. And, and then finish with some grand challenges for collaborative AI. I, had, I have proposed this as a 20 minute talk. So we, that should help us catch up somewhat with, the, with being behind schedule. Let me start by saying what I mean by collaboration. Collaboration is a process where two or more agents work together as partners to achieve a shared goal. That means they have a goal and they share that goal. Um, this is a, not my definition, it came from Tavim um, in a paper in knowledge-based systems back in 95. And collaborative AI is the science and technology of AI systems that collaborate with humans. 
So we think this is a very important catalyst for the maturation and integration of technologies for human-centered AI and technologies that help human and benefit humans rather than replace them. That's been the slogan of Humane AI, AI Net since we first proposed it. Um, in uh, AI for You, in the working group, over a series of three years, we worked through a taxonomy of different kinds of, of uh, collaborative systems to try and sort things out because there were many different collaboration problems and many different things that people could say about collaboration using very different technological fields. So essentially what we observed was that categories of collaboration can be defined by the nature of the information that's exchanged by the collaborators and the nature of the information that's used by the system. These categories form a natural hierarchy with each level building on lower levels. And in fact, once you have these layers, these levels, you can almost see them as an architecture for building collaborative systems with increasing capabilities or increasing abilities. This was the outcome from collaborative uh, AI working group in AI for You. And let me, let me delve into that for just a minute to explain what I mean. At the lowest level, we have what I'll call reactive collaboration. These are tightly coupled interactions where the actions of each agent are immediately sensed and used to trigger actions by the others. This is what classic robotics and human robot interaction and much of human computer interaction does. It's at this level, the reactive level. Uh, Pierre Blish, you should find yourself at home with this level because uh, much of control theory and, and the kind of uh, robotics that's fairly mature now is at the reactive level. Um, some examples, well, for example, many modern cars now have um, uh, reactive collaboration for lane keeping. Lane assist uh, generates an auditory alarm if you start to drift out of your uh, lane and also generates forces on the steering wheel. Um, blind spot detection will generate auditory alarms for vehicles in your blind spot. Brake assist will adapt the brake force depending on time to contact and various things like that that help make the car safer through reaction. There's no linguistic explanation going on. It's all through the forces of the control or auditory signals. Uh, another form of reactive collaboration is growing popularly now on the web. Um, these are effective agents. These are agents um, typically using GPT-3 or variations that um, do tightly coupled perception action that mirror emotions, classically detecting engagement from posture, gaze, face expression, recognizing Ekman's basic emotions from facial action units, doing sentiment analysis from language, and, and, and basically trying to incite or evoke positive emotions in an interactor. They share the goal of making people feel good. However, if you play with these agents, one of the things you quickly discover, they don't really understand the situation. They don't really know what you're talking about. They just know how to imit imitate your text and imitate what your feelings are. They lack situation awareness. So above reactive is the level that we call situational. Situational interaction are perceptions, actions, and interactions that are mediated by shared comprehension of a situation. Okay. This term situation is very well established in cognitive science and, and ergonomics. Situation modeling, widely used in cognitive science for almost 50 years. Fifth, situationers are essentially states. Any computer scientist can understand. They're states defined by relations, which are modeled as predicates, between entities, which are essentially anything you can perceive or recognize. A uh, really nice example are chess chunks. I mean, this is a nice clean domain where we can study situation modeling because of the very limited capacity of people's working memory. And this is well documented in cognitive science. Um, anybody who works in that area will recognize right away and there's lots and lots of references. Um, situation modeling and situation awareness are widely used in ergonomics and human factors. This is the perception of elements of the environment, um, the comprehension of their meaning and projection of their status in the near future, according to Ensley. And, and in ergonomics, we identify three specific levels of situation awareness, perception, comprehension, and projection. Perceiving the entities, associating them to memories to derive meaning, and forecasting what's going to happen next. Um, interestingly, my Tesla has a situation model. Okay, it displays for me on a screen. It's a geographic position, routes, traffic lanes, nearby vehicles, road signs, speed limit, um, current speed, target speed, all this stuff it knows. These are entities that it's perceived. 
And it knows about relations, whether I'm approaching the car in front of me, whether I'm passing a car or drifting out of my lane. And it can do actions based on the situation, such as regulate my speed, follow the other vehicle, stay in the lane, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, it can't explain linguistically what it's doing. The explanation is via an image. I can look on the screen to see what's happening. There's no ability to use language to explain why it takes such and such an action, which is a little bit um, unnerving. Um, how can I say? It makes you angry sometimes. You want to know why did it do that? Um, Research challenge uh, is to enable humans and intelligent systems to share their comprehension through explanation with natural language. Um, and we think there's an interesting, in, in human AI net, we think there's an interesting opportunity to do this with multimodal interaction with transformers. And let me give an, explain, uh, an example. This is actually a model that came out of Cordelia Th uh, Schmidt's research in 2019 with the thesis of Alexander Pasevich. Some of you may know him. Um, and this is actually becoming a, a, a widely copied model for how to do multimodal interaction with transformers. You have a, an individual transformer with each um, modality, and then you draw them together with uh, self-attention and interattention um, to generate a transformer, to generate the decode um, and generate um, actions. Okay? Um, and self-attention in this case solves a lot of the outstanding problems in multimodal perception and interaction. Self-attention determines mutually relevant information. And you train it, of course, by missing token, um, missing token um, generation and, and next token uh, substitution or whatever. Um, it, our challenge right now is to, can we use cross-modal attention with multimodal transformers to generate linguistic explanations for perception and for comprehension? I think that's something that is open to us now, but no one's done it yet, but it's going to happen soon. So the challenge we've posed in Humane AI Net is to create technologies that enable humans and intelligent agents to share comprehension of situation through explanation with natural language. Um, and the idea is to use the latent variables from a multimodal transformer as a form of situation model, turn the predicates um, into linguistic constructs, into verbs, uh, the entities into nouns. Um, and essentially to decode what the system understands and, and why it's taking such and such an action from that, to generate narratives that provide a structure for, ex for explaining situations. This is in the research roadmap that we've produced in Humane AI Net, but again, it hasn't been done yet, but we're working on it. And I think it's an interesting open problem. I'll share it with my colleagues. Beyond situational, there's the level of operational. Operational collaboration is the coordinated execution of tasks or activities by two or more agents to achieve the shared goal. Okay, this is working through the series of situations. Um, and operational collaboration very much is about sharing authority over initiating, conducting, and terminating tasks and activities. And this is typically done with roles and, and protocols. Uh, shared protocols for polite interaction govern much of our social interaction. They govern what we look at, what we do, and how we communicate. Protocols simplify interaction by providing a script that describes a limited set of messages, a limited set of behaviors that a participant should expect to receive and, and can communicate or perform himself. Um, protocols of social customs, if you prefer, are examples of operational collaboration that regulate meetings, team sports, road vehicle traffic, air traffic control, military operations, and many other areas. Our challenge here is to develop technologies that can explain and comprehend operational intentions. What are you trying to do? Why, why are you trying to do it that way? Technologies to allow systems to learn social interaction, social protocols, social customs, and technologies to permit humans and intelligent systems to negotiate and degree on roles, who can do what, who has the authority or not to do something and how to interact. Beyond that, there's an additional level, which in AI for You, we call practical. Um, this is exchange of knowledge in general, not specific, but in general, of how to attain goals and maximize value based on experience or training. Practical collaboration is exchanging of knowledge about, for example, how to use a tool, how to operate a machine, how to assemble or repair a device, 
how to win at a competition, how to act so as to maximize value. Technology's um, challenges now in this area um, include how to acquire practical knowledge from explanation and from experience and combining, and, and how to share practical knowledge by explanation. So this goes way beyond simply explaining a decision to actually explaining to a collaborator how to get something done or explaining or understanding from an explanation how things can be done. Beyond that, in ai for you we identified one additional level, creative. Creative collaboration is when two or more partners work together to solve a problem or create an original artifact. Um, actually, this has been one of those holy grails of AI systems since the early days. Early um, expert systems that were a kind of creative um, uh, system were um, classic expert systems such as myosin, the, the granddaddy of all expert systems. It was a rule-based expert system to help doctors to develop antibiotic therapies. Or R1, which was a rule-based expert system to configure VAX computers that made a, a huge profit the first year of operation when it was used by Digital Equipment Corporation. Of course, um, expert systems died because of the horrendously expensive cost and, and fragility of encoding knowledge. Um, expert knowledge just is very, very hard to, to, inca to capture in most domains. This is why we need machine learning. Modern attempts at using um, this in this area to, to, use, to create generative collaboration include things like cognitive computing, which IBM Watson tried to do with, uh, with what IBM tried to do with its Watson system. And more recently, AI code generators, such as Codex, uh, Copilot, or TI Coder, <clears throat> or automated layout systems for integrated circuits using it, that Apple's recently produced. Um, examples of research challenges include technologies to permit humans and intelligence systems to collaboratively design artifacts, technologies to permit humans and systems to collaboratively plan operations or, or agree on contingencies. Now, my point here is that collaboration requires explanation. And, and again, this goes beyond simply explaining a decision. An explanation, a uh, normal dictionary definition, is a statement, typically linguistic, that makes something clear or justifies an action. At the reactive level, the explanation describes a response to a stimuli. At the situational level, it describes a relation between entities. At the operational level, it describes a sequence of intended actions. At the practical level, it describes how to perform a task and at creative levels, it describes problems and problem, possible problem solutions. Explanations share comprehension. They're really about sharing comprehension. The ability and comprehension, by the way, a technical term from cognitive psychology, again, widely used, the ability to understand the meaning and importance of a sensory precept or linguistic construct. Not my definition, that of Kinch. And among other things, this definition is widely used in reading science and education science. For example, reading comprehension is defined as assimilation, the uh, projecting a, a, what you read into an internal representation and embedding, if you like, association with existing memories to reveal meaning, and integration of meaning to adapt awareness. Okay? This is straight out of Kinch. Okay? So explanations are about sharing comprehension and there's an interesting duality between explanation and comprehension. We sat down in, in UN AI Net and, and tried to distill um, what was common to all the different levels of, of uh, explanation and comprehension in our, in our framework. And the same things kept recurring. You need to explain a reaction and comprehend a reaction. To explain a situation, you need to comprehend a situation. To explain an intention, you need to comprehend the intention to explain an operation, et cetera. And in fact, these two meta problems emerged of explaining a comprehension and comprehending an explanation at each level. However, the techniques that you would use depend on the level. What you would do at a reactive level are very different than what you might do at an operational level or even at a creative level. Reactive comprehension describes how actions are generated from perceptions. Situational, 
describes the relevant entities and relations. So if you want to build a, a system to understand a situation model, you, you, well, you need the entities and relations. Operational comprehension is about um, plans and intentions, practical about how to accomplish goals, and creative comprehension about how to construct original artifacts. Um, all of these, both of these depend on some, an additional ability, the ability to adapt. Adaptation um, is fundamental for collaboration and in particular adaptation through the acquisition and refinement of abilities from experience and from explanation, which is indeed a form of learning. So I could, I could, could would I put learning here, but it's not just any old type of learning. It's not just going offline with backpropagation and training your network. This is really about online adaptation through the interaction, through experience, and through explanation with the partner, which brings to a grand challenge. So I haven't even taken my 20 minutes. I'll help us get, get back on, on the script. The grand challenge is to develop AI technologies for comprehension, explanation, and adaptive learning for reactive, situational, operational, practical, and creative collaboration. Um, and that's what I wanted to say. And uh, I was able to do it in, in 18 minutes. So thank you very much. Oh, yes, one more thing. Um, for more information, there's a paper coming out this month in IEEE Pervasive that develops this framework and the problems of comprehension um, explanation and adaptation. Um, the paper's not yet on the IEEE website. This it should be this month's issue, but you can download it from my own website. And you can also download the Humane AI Net revised strategic research agenda, which goes into these problems and poses research challenges for the Humane AI Net and our external collaborators, because part of our funding is for linked third parties or for external third parties who can work, but UGA, and uh, IMPG and INRIA are all members of Humane and INET and eligible for funding. Okay, so thank you very much. Pierre Bryce? Pierre Bryce? Yes, thank you, James, for this uh, different view on unexplainable AI. So, do we have any questions? No questions? It was perfectly You have clear. something from AQ, uh, iPhone AQ. Hi, I have a question. I have a question. Ah, Fosca, hi. I don't know if you see the... Yeah, Fosca, you're driving Why in your you car. Why you disagree with me? The framework that you set up. Uh, not Dino's driving, I'm a... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, just very short, but we can discuss. I think that this framework is uh, uh, it's really one of the very few new things that I see in the in the scene so far, and I think it's uh, it's very important to, to to attach the explanation there. When I talk of explanation, it's explanation of the black box. I think there is a space for uh, connecting to the comprehension part. I don't know. So why do you disagree with me? I don't disagree with you. I think I think um, I, I guess what I wanted to say was that there's more to there's more to explanation than simply dis explaining decisions. But in, in fact, Fosca and Dina and I have had some recent really interesting conversations about how we could generate such explanations at some of the more recent meetings. I was hoping to have a chance to meet with the, them at this meeting and to talk more about that. But what we can do that offline. Thanks, Fosca. Okay, we, we have another question here. Thank you very much, James. Um, my question is, uh, through this uh, kind of iterative process we, uh, with the, the machine-human interaction in order to, to come up with a, a shared comprehension of, of, the, of the reasoning process of the machine, do you think that uh, at this point we will get systems that are uh, fully understandable by, by the human beings but actually not very good at the task that they're supposed to do. Do, do, you, do you think that uh, by creating this, um, by putting some constraints basically on the, on the design of the system, we might reduce the performance? Yeah, I, I, I see the danger. If you, if you focus, if you require the system to be able to generate an explanation, then you're, you're, you might be 
uh, what's the English word, bounding it or limiting its, its potential. I don't look at the problem that way. First of all, let me say that none of this yet has been done. This is a research direction, a, a proposal, a paradigm to be explored and that people are starting to explore, but, but the proof is in the experiments and we're still waiting to see those experiments. Um, I, I personally think this will take 10, 15 years to really play out and, and hope that part of this, the way that we come about by building these explanations will be what Fosca said through narration and in particular building narratives around the quintillion questions of who, what, why, where, and how. Yeah. Narratives are, are stories. Narratives describe a sequence, sequence of state transitions and, and essentially who, what, where, why, and how define the states and define how they transform. And from that, you can attempt to get both a causal model and a descriptive model. Now, um, that's an approach, and I'm, I think that approach should be applicable at situational, operational, and practical levels. Creative is a bit more of a challenge, and, and reactive is probably a whole different ballgame. But that's that's kind of my view today on where we're going. But I don't think I don't think we're quite yet, there yet. And I certainly wouldn't want this to be something that that limits what we can do with AI technologies for helping people. Did that answer your question? Uh, partly because uh, also my secondary question was: uh, today we are able to sometimes learn from the system. Uh, yes. I don't know. For instance, in Go, uh, they were able to, to to find out new strategies that were um, not understandable at first. Uh, by having these kind of constraints, okay, I need to understand every single step of the way. Then we might limit and uh, our ability to get surprised by the system. Chess masters learn from chess player, chess games. Yes, yeah, so the best chess generators actually teach chess masters new ways of looking at the problem. That's, that's something that's very interesting, but they don't do it through a linguistic explanation. They do it by playing chess. Um, they, they, the chess master is in the interface of the chess game, where it's that way. Um, I, I, I still adhere to what I, what I understand fundamentally as an explanation is, is, an, is a statement, a linguistic statement. And I think we really need um, to continue developing um, natural language processing techniques in combination with perception planning and, um, and robotics in general. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to do in the area, um, but I'm not quite sure. I think I drifted off of the, your question though. That's good, all right, thanks. And we have a last question. Hello, hello Jim. Um, in fact, yes, I, I think we, um, in the both presentation we had, uh, verbalization is really, uh, so the, the use of language is perhaps too, uh, too present and uh, perhaps a bit limiting. And I think uh, for, for teaching or learning demonstrations of this, uh, the problem of embodiment is, is crucial. As you mentioned, uh, chess, you, you, you play chess by demonstrating chess. Uh, it's better, it's more efficient than just, uh, than just uh, describing the displacement of, uh, of, of chess uh, pieces. And it's the same for uh, social behaviors and so on. So uh, a lot of, uh, I think it was the limitation of expert systems, is that uh, a lot of uh, expertise is just intuitive and uh, cannot be, can be demonstrated by your body, by your body. Yeah, of course, speech is part of, a, of your body, it's an embodiment. But uh, with you, your your whole body. So, my question is: Do, do you think that uh, in, within this framework we can we can th think about intelligent system which are not embodied? You are you are well. First of all, you, you know my answer. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, I don't know the answer, but let me say you're quite correct in that the richest explanations are multimodal. They both display and describe linguistically, and and when we teach children. And when we teach each other, we tend to rely on language enhanced with demonstration. Okay? You want to get people to have that firsthand experience, which anchors the meaning of the explanation. But at the same time, we tend to communicate linguistically. And, and, and I don't think we want to play down too much that linguistic. But, but we should certainly shouldn't limit the ability of our systems because we need an, a linguistic explanation. So I, I think multimodal explanations certainly have their place and are very important. Yeah, thanks, Gerard. 
And for those who don't know, Gerard is my co-chair on uh, collaborative AI. So, I, but I didn't plant him in the audience to ask that question. Thank you very much, James. Uh, now we are going to move to the next talk. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. So the next talk will be given to us by Sophia Shah, who is uh, co-head of the chair uh, towards robust and understandable neuromorphic systems. Um, if I'm not mistaken, she is mostly uh, she can be in introduced as a statistician working with neuroscientists. Yes. And her talk will be about graphing the brain, perspectives yes. on graph theory for the understanding of neural networks and the brain. Yes, thanks. Thanks for the nice introduction. And I will need the, the slide. My talk is on the computer here. Uh, okay, it's there, nice. So thanks a lot, yeah. I would say we are a co creative collaboration in this team, so I'm not alone. There's lots of people. It's a good mix between permanent and PhD and postdoc people and from all over uh, Grenoble University. So for, for this talk, I need three ingredients here. So as you said, so statistics for networks, it's where I will learn how to deal with an, a graph with uh, nodes and edges between these nodes. And then the brain, so how uh, can we understand uh, this, uh, the, uh, the, the functioning of the brain. And the last part from this uh, nice project is the artificial neural networks. And, and in this uh, context, so we built, the, the, the project was built on top of some expertise and uh, we brought with, with Michel Doja, we brought this uh, loop here where we developed statistics for networks to understand the brain and while understanding the brain, we have to develop new statistics for networks. And this, is, will, this will be the first, first part of my talk and this will be this is the, the main subject of Lucretia's PhD thesis. And this, the, 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 la, the, the other part of the project is, was brought by Martial Mermillo, he's here in the room, and, and he's looking at neuromorphic systems. So how can we take some part from the understanding of the brain and put them in the artificial neural networks, right? <laughs> and, and both together, finally, we make the, this arrow here to go from statistics for networks to understand what uh, are in the artificial neural network. And it will be the second part of my talk. And of course, the graph is full. So there's arrows everywhere. People are working in all directions. And you, know, you all know that uh, the, the graph neural networks, for example, to study uh, nodes in the so characterize nodes in the graphs. And of course, the use of artificial net neural network is also uh, studied a lot for understanding and classifying the anatomical re uh, images of the brain, for example. But at first I want to, so as, as you said, it's between statistics and, and neuroscience. And I want to show you some uh, previous work we've done on the understanding of the brain and using these statistics. So all these acquisition here can be done in Grenoble. So it's different way to observe the brain at the macro scale, at the meso scale, and the, at the macro scales. So I will mainly focus at the macro scale here and in the micro, sorry. But the, all these uh, techniques can be done in Grenoble. And, and my work and the work of the, the project was to go from this time series here. So for each of these uh, acquisition, we're observing time series, so functioning of the brain in time. And each of these time series is associated to a brain region. And the, and the goal is to, to, to go from this time series to a network and then to extract some features from these networks. So again, a node in the graph here or network will be a brain region and a link between two nodes will be the uh, same functioning of the brain regions, for example. And this is linked, of course, to uh, 
we are going from a phrenological view of the brain to a connectivist view of the brain, where each function will be associated to a network and not only one region. And for these for this, uh, graphs, so we will have a, a collections of graphs, collections of networks, and we need to extract features, so statistics, from these graphs. And these are examples of these statistics we will extract. So on the first example, so here I'm plotting two different graphs with different features. So on the top left, you can see a, a difference in terms of the cost of the, of the network. So one has low cost with few edges and another one with high cost. The efficiency is linked to the minimum path length between the nodes. So on your left, it's high efficient, highly efficient. You can reach two nodes very easily. And on the right is low efficient. You have to go through lots of nodes to reach the, the, the whole nodes of the network. And I will go back with this efficiency and this sort of uh, uh, statistics afterwards. So you have to remember them. <laughs> and the, the clustering is to characterize the neighbors of a node in the, in, in the graph. So again, on the left is low clustering. Lots of nodes, the node one, the, the neighbors of node one are not really connected to each other. And on your right, then they are clustered. And finally, the modularity is characterizing a graph as modules. So this one is low, uh, is, um, low modularity, has got a low modularity with lo no, no modules, in fact, just one. And this one is highly uh, modules, highly modular with lots of uh, different clusters. So these are typical graph statistics we are extracting on graph to understand the brain better. And I want to show you just uh, three, different, uh, three different experiments we did, rec we finished recently, but we, we started them uh, a long time ago now. It was mainly funded by NeuroCog, and it's a link between MIAE and NeuroCog here. So here in this experiment, my colleagues in Jin, they were acquiring uh, mice uh, turning on the rotor road, and they were looking at how the mice are learning how to run on the rotor road by measuring the time they fell off the rotor road. And we can uh, record the activity of the neurons. So it's ex vivo, it's not in vivo, the activity of the neurons ex vivo after a certain day of trainings. And what uh, we finally extracted from these data sets is that you can see here plots of activation of the um, different cells. And in red, you can see the area where the highly active cells are. And what we can see is depending on the area in the brain, so the dorsal, medial striatum or the dorsal lateral striatum, you can have different architecture of the positioning of the highly active cells in the brain, meaning that something happening during the training between the neurons. A different, a completely, so this is micro scale, and a completely different study was concerning macro scale. So here, so it was uh, in collaboration with Monica Basio, and we uh, re-explored uh, uh, already obtained data sets using task fMRI in language. So these are, are all the data sets gathered by Monica, for, uh, I think uh, ranging from maybe 10 years, something like that. And we uh, extracted um, a graph, a network for each of these tasks, and we explored the architecture of these networks for, all, for, for these different tasks. And what we, can, what we observed is that you can classify the different tasks using uh, the graph, only the graph, and then using a data-driven, we were able to uh, plot this uh, very nice uh, sort of interpolation between the different tasks uh, gathered all around these uh, in-long data sets. And this is the, the language connectum we have obtained. And uh, uh, on a final fourth, a final example, I want to show you some um, 
uh, experiments using healthy volunteers and patients to show you how we had to adapt the tools of this uh, brain, of these graphs, to be able to extract better interpretation of the brain. So here we, we use the classic pipeline, so the, times, the observation, so it was fMRI time series, then the construction of networks for each of the subjects. And I, I had two groups here, the, the healthy volunteers and the patients. And what you can sh plot is the efficiency. So you remember this minimum path length, the average minimum path length for all the graph, depending on the cost and depending on controls and patients. And here, what you can see is that there's no difference between controls and patients. And these patients were in coma. So you can imagine that you need to find a difference. Of course, there's a difference here. And, and this motivates us to develop a new tool to compare graphs because using usual graph metrics, we were not able to extract any differences. And of course, in terms of graph comparison, I'm sure you've heard about this edit distance and all these sort of things. So there's lots of different techniques on, uh, already developed to explore these distances between graphs. But the common point of view, all these uh, methods, they do not, um, they are invariant by permutation. So whenever the nodes are shifted, they don't care. But in the brain, we care because we don't want to mix the occipital lobe with the frontal lobe and all these sort of things. So we had to develop a new method. And so th this is the first part of my talk. And this is the, uh, this was done mainly by Lucrecia. And, and what we, so again, we've got the classic pipeline and we want to classify between the two groups of, of subjects. And we want to use graph nodal statistics, so go back at the nodal level, at the regional level of the brain. We want to be, uh, we don't want to be invariant to permutation of, of nodes. We want to keep the, the role of the nodes. And we want to allow also easy interpretation. So you can imagine that I, don't, I, I won't go to deep learning here. I won't use deep learning. On, because I want to keep all this uh, nice visualization and nice interpretation. So now let's go to the math, mathematical part of my talk. So I'm sorry, I, I changed completely topics from what happened before. And we will, uh, I will uh, have some uh, equations here, but not a lot. <laughs> so we developed a new way to characterize the node of the graphs. And this way is to put an equivalence relation between the nodes given a certain statistic. So one statistic can be efficiency, degree, clustering, and anything. And we will say that two nodes are equivalent in the graph if they got the same, if we can extract the same statistics for each of these, for, for the two nodes. And of course, you can extend this notion to different uh, statistics because you can. You, you may ask me by why using degree or why using efficiency. Of course, we don't know. So here, you can extend the notion of equivalence to any set of statistics and then have a, a way to characterize the node of the graphs in, independent of the choice of the st statistics because you can use uh, what, uh, what set, whatever set you want. And once you've got an equivalence relation in math, you want to do partition. And that's exactly what we propose. So you can uh, define induced partition on a set of vertices given a set of statistics. And this will give you a set of nodes that share the same role in the graph. And just an example here to make sure that you understood well. So here uh, we plotted two different graphs and you can see that there's only one difference between these two graphs. Here we added one edge here. And adding this edge is changing the partitions. So the partitions are colored here. So green is one partition and red 
and yellow and, and pink here. And you can see on this graph, I've got four partitions. And on this one, I've got only three because I added this edge. And these are so these partitions are computed using the degree. So I put in the partition the same the node with the same degree. So that gives me a way, in fact, to classify the nodes of the networks. And then based on that, you can construct different quantities to characterize your networks. So the first one is the heterogeneity of nodal structural roles, and it's defined like this where we are counting the permutations preserving the, um, the induced partition. And if I'm going back to my examples, it's linked to the heterogeneity because if I've got uh, a, a relatively uh, low amount of partitions like these two graphs, my power coefficient will be close to 0.5. If I'm, if I, um, when you have only um, one node per partition, then you will have uh, a zero uh, power coefficient saying that your graph is uh, a lot of, there's a lot of heterogeneity. Oh no, it, it was one because we changed it, one minus the, nice. And you, you know, I told you I want to go back to the nodal level. So I want to characterize the way my, the nodes of the collections of graphs are uh, different from, from each other. And this is defined by the nodal percentage of participation. It's defined here. And here I'm counting the percentage of participation of each node of the vertices in non-trivial classes. So non-trivial classes is when the partition is different from one node. And again, if I'm coming back to my example, here with these two graphs, I can obtain a graph like that where I can classify each node of the graph and say how they are different from these two graphs. So node I, A to I, so, sorry, will share their roles with other nodes in both graphs because they appear in the same partitions. Node L has a specific role in the two graphs. It's one part, it's a single uh, partition here and here. And, the, the, and node M depends on graph instance. Because here, you know, remember it was related to these two uh, graphs in the same partition, and here it was isolated. So this way, I can classify and group the nodes of the graphs. And, and finally, uh, we also built a, a new metric to define the differences between the, the statistics. So I, I told you that you can look at degree, efficiency, and all the different, and so this between S, for example. And you can see here that on these two graphs, so you've got the same number, the same degree. Each node of this graph have the same degree. But when you look at between S, so it's the way the, the, where the minimum path length are going in the graph, then the nodes, the, the, you don't have the same partitions here, completely different partitions as the, as the degree, meaning that using betweenness has more information than the degree. And what we introduce here is a way to compare these statistics, and we called it orthogonal statistics for heterogeneity evaluation of a collection element. And this is based on this formula here, where it's the ratio between the number of nodes in non-trivial classes and the total number of vertices. And just let me move directly to an example here. So here, on this example, so, uh, it's one graph with one set of edges. And I'm looking here at degree and betweenness. And on this specific graph, the partition are, near, are uh, nearly the same in between the degree and betweenness, meaning that the orthogonality is one, one statistic is enough informative, finally. So I, don't, I do, just need one statistic. But if you change the architecture of the network, and if you use, for example, this one, then the partitions are relatively different between the degree and betweenness, so the, the, the points are not colored the same way. 
and the orthogonality is 0.5. So in this example, it's better to use at the same time degree and betweenness. And finally, you can have two perfectly orthogonal nodal statistics, and then you have to use uh, both to, to the, the two nodal statistics are important. So I need to move a bit uh, faster. And I just want to show you two examples. So we, uh, we used all these data sets, and they are freely available. And we looked at the orthogonality scores for each of, the, of these data sets. So it's coma, comatose patient here and Parkinson patient here. And we were able to discriminate the two groups using the orthogonal scores, but not using the average. Here, it's the usual way to do that. Oops, just the, the, the average, taking the average between the two groups. And we were able to find nice classification scores to discriminate the two groups. And these classification scores depends on the couple of statistics you are uh, using. So, so again, it's important to choose the statistics correctly and to mix them. And finally, we can have also an, uh, an evaluation at the nodal level of the, of the brain. And here I represent in red the healthy volunteers and in green the comatose patient. And we can see that for some uh, regions of the brain, the participation coefficient is really different, meaning that there are some, inter some meaning behind all that. Nice, and in the rest of the talk, I will move to the second part for the link between this brain-inspired functional connectivity analysis and artificial neural net networks. So the, the question was, is it possible to identify results of classification on neural networks? So I'm thinking of two different contexts, the adversarial attack, where you all know that you can recognize the digit on these two images, but the neural network won't be able, and it will give you a three or an eight, depending on the activation of the neurons of the neural networks. And the other example is continual learning, so it's the subject of Martial, where you, you know that the neural networks are forgetting and, and you will lose the accuracy during continual learning. So I will focus on the, on the rest on catastrophic forgetting, but Dwight is working on the adversarial attack in this, in this context. And we want to see how we can recognize when a neural network is forgetting just on looking, by looking on the architecture of the neural networks and the activation of the neurons. So that's what we did in this, in this context. So we um, worked with Marion Maison. She is uh, a PhD student with Martial and, and Marina in CEA. And she's working on continual learning with emotion, face emotion recognition. So you all know this. You have images, and you need to choose which emotion. And, and she's working on seven different tasks. And they developed a specific networks, DreamNet, to avoid this catastrophic forgetting. So it's a complex architecture, and I will leave Martial answer the question on that. And, and the, they proved that it's very good accuracy. Deep, so the DreamNet is here. Uh, it's orange one, and I think the pink one is also an alternative to, uh, to avoid catastrophic product getting. The offline is when you learn, when you learn task one, you have task one, and when you learn task two, you have task one and task two, and, and when you learn task three, again, you are adding all the, the tasks. So, of course, you've got a very nice accuracy because it's like having all the data sets at some point. And the, and the naive one is this, the blue one is this one is the one where you are learning one task and then learning a, the second task, but don't you don't have the first uh, images and you will lose, you will forget, in fact. And and the question was, are we able to quantify why DreamNet performs well on this specific task? So we use our graph toolbox to see how we can extract features on the graphs, so on the neural networks this time, not the, the brain. 
So the, the neural network is here on the, on the left, and we are thresholding it to keep the more active edges and the more active nodes in the, in the networks, and then we will have a graph, a directed graph with nodes and edges. And we will extract features from these uh, graphs, and we will use in and out degree. So in degree is the edges that are uh, arriving on one node, like the gold one here, and out degree is the edges that are going outside. So here, my uh, gold node has a, a in minus out degree of two. And we are doing this for at each learning task. So for learning task one, we will extract the graph features here too, and then learning task two, the network has changed because it learned a new task, and it's one and, and zero, and again for all the tasks. And what we were able to do is to uh, plot distributions of this in minus out degree for each node of the, of the networks and along the learning of the different tasks. So this is the distribution obtained with the fine-tuned strategy where uh, you are just forgetting along the, the tasks. And what you can see is that the distribution is converging to a, a sort of Gaussian distribution. And, and I want you to pay attention to the tail of the distribution, because when we look at DreamNet strategy, then for the DreamNet strategy, we've got high heavy tails for this distribution, meaning that something happening on the heavy tails of the, these nodes. So the nodes with high in minus out degree have a sort of important role in the network. And, and based on that, so we selected the, the first and, and third quartiles of the distributions. And based on that, we were able to discriminate uh, networks where these ones are completely forgetting the task, and these one are not. And even the dream net is uh, different, different from the offline. So it's a sort of, so it's work in progress. But it's a sort of proof of concept saying that we can see something on what's happening with the strategy on what's happening on the neural networks directly on the activation and the, the architecture of these neural networks. And uh, for this, it's finished. And as a conclusion, I think we are developing new framework for comparison of spatial temporal models. And we succeeded to apply it to artificial neural networks, finally. And of course, we lo we've got lots of different things to do now, and especially a bit more statistical test and, and statistical way to formalize all that. And I, I want to advertise something. So we are part of a group uh, mixing the three AI Institute. And there will be a, a specific workshop in Paris on the uh, biomedical imaging, in AI for biomedical imaging. Thanks a lot for your attention. Nice. One question already. Thank you for this very clear, interesting talk. Uh, I have a question about the uh, scalability of your uh, measurement because, uh, of course, for pedagogical reason, you, you, you give us uh, small uh, graphs, but I, I can imagine that for the brain, and even for neural network, they are very big, so there is no problem for, uh, of computation for uh, computing the statistics? On Not now. <laughs> so at the, at the moment, you, all these degree efficiency and so on, you can compute them for millions of nodes. So the, 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 the biggest problem for the brain is to have uh, high, uh, very um, high dimension data sets where you can go to very uh, small regions in the brain. It's more from the acquisition, the problem, rather than from the computation. And in terms of the neural network, so the one we looked at were uh, small. So in terms of the DreamNet is not a big uh, neural network. But, but these sort of, uh, of quantities, 
you can compute them for for high high dimension network. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you, Sophie. Um, I, I want to come back to your um, work on uh, characterizing uh, graphs uh, uh, that you said that uh, you want to characterize them such that uh, basically uh, uh, to give give a read of the um, permutation of, yes. the, of the node. Okay, so yeah. basically are you talking about graphs that always have the same number of graphs, yeah. uh, <laughs> number of nodes and different yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm fixing the number. I'm fixing the nodes. Okay. And and I'm uh, fixing the edges also, oh, okay. but the number of edges. But I'm live. I'm 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 selecting only the highly active links okay. in the brain, and okay. I'm selecting ten percent of the mostly active or twenty percent of the mostly active. Okay. But and the the, the main point. So is the, sorry. So the graphs have the same topology. No, the graph have the same uh, global parameters, number of nodes, and cost sparsity okay. Okay. of the of the network, but the edges are not at the same place. Okay, and that's what we want to recognize, and that's okay. what's happening in the coma patients. Okay, because there is a old sorry way to characterize this by um, using uh, characteristic polynomials. Yes. And not not necessarily the the one that allows you to compute eigenvalues, but there are more mm. different ways of different polynomials that people developed. And, yeah. And basically, all you have to do is to compute uh, a determinant. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you. And we uh, so we used also these sort of characteristics, but it's less easy to interpret them and to and to show what's happening in the okay, brain. Yeah, so that's right. why we moved to these statistics okay. where you can really point where the brain, the, the regions of the brain are failing in a, in a sense. Okay. But I agree with you. Yeah, there are lots of different okay, ways. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Nice. The last question, please. <laughs> I'm sorry to be accustomed to, to, to close. Um, I have a question about the uh, connectivity. Here it's uh, zero or one. So there is, uh, there is uh, some, some ways, in fact, to in first to incorporate uh, the strength ways. and the yes. second, the time. So the uh, causal relations, yeah. like uh, in, in Bayesian dy dy dynamic networks, where you, you take account of, uh, of the uh, temporal uh, and causal um, mm. uh, connectivity. Yeah, it's an important question. I we I, I, I would um, uh, give the question to Michel and Emmanuel in terms of acquisition because in fact we don't have enough accurate data sets for the moment to look at the causality, especially using fMRI data sets. So because we are yeah, it's one second. It's every one second. The bold yeah, but the bold has five second delay. So it's really complicated. So we need to move to EEG or MEG or any other. And even with this, we need to have very uh, strong paradigm with very nice experiments to really uh, challenge the causality. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I would say it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a trade-off between having enough accurate acquisition and nice statistical tools and, 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 and covering the whole brain too. So that's a big, yeah, thanks. Nice, thanks. <laughs> Thank you again, Sophie. So the last I talk of the session will be given by Laurent Bezassier. Uh, Laurent was a professor at uh, Université Grenoble Alpes and leading the uh, Get Alp group on um, natural language and speech processing, but uh, generally last year he moved to, not, not very far, Naval Labs Europe, who is also, so which is a company um, uh, collaborating closely with uh, the Institute, uh, where he heads the natural language processing group. Um, so uh, Laurent will sp uh, speak more about this uh, new uh, uh, position, well, the work he's doing there in, in a more um, 
company oriented then uh, so the talk will be about towards higher high quality multilingual neural new role machine translation in production Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. So um, yeah, I moved uh, from academia to industry two years ago uh, to Naval Labs Europe, which is a research center of the Europe uh, of the Korean company Naver. So Naver is, among other things, produce um, um, digital services for users that are mostly in Korea, also in in Japan. And uh, some of these digital services are search engines, uh, shopping platforms, and also even more specific uh, um, tasks such as uh, online translation. And basically, I'm going to talk about a very specific task, which is a, a machine translation. And um, as someone who moved from uh, academia to industry, I thought it would be timely maybe to uh, uh, describe some collaboration that has been made closely between us in Never Lab, so we are scientists, but we have been working with um, uh, co Korean colleagues, uh, Quen Wu and Dan, who are them uh, working in, uh, more in production uh, for uh, an entity of Never that is called Papago. And basically Papago produces uh, uh, machine translation for uh, the internal needs of the company, but also for for the users who again are mostly uh, uh, in Korea and Japan. And so, of course, this is a joint work with some colleagues from Never Lab, so Alex, Vasina, Stefan, Caroline, and uh, also we have been working with uh, an intern called Ali Reza. So. Uh, I will first introduce what is uh, multilingual uh, neural machine translation. Uh, we have a very five, very very short five minute crash course on what is uh, what is neural machine translation, and then um, I will mention what are the what is happening in these multilingual uh, models, but what is also challenging, and then I will present uh, two contributions one we made in 2021, uh, and one we made even more recently. Um, so let me first introduce very quickly uh, how those modern um, neural machine translation models work uh, nowadays. Uh, can we see, okay, there is a pointer here. So um, basically modern neural machine translation are encoder decoder models, which means that basically when we want to translate from a source sentence that you have here, here in French, uh, we are going first to project those tokens into a continuous space, so this is so-called embeddings. But at this stage, basically, those green embeddings that you can see here, they are uh, not really contextualized, so basically these embeddings will be a representation of this word without taking into account the rest of the, of the, of the context. Uh, we are going to add to this uh, some um, positional uh, encoding uh, in order to know where those words are in the sequence. And then um, this uh, representation are going to be encoded with, uh, well, you can use different kind of architecture, but nowadays in 20, uh, since 2020, uh, we are using transformer architecture. So several transformer blocks are going to, uh, to be used to obtain those representations that are now more contextualized. So basically, for instance, this uh, vector here is not only a representation of the input word here, but somehow you can consider that this is a representation in a, in a given context, in the context of this sentence. So definitely more abstract and contextualized representation that, you, that are obtained here. And then, uh, in order to produce an output, for instance, an output in, in English, the model is going to generate uh, one word at one token at a time, and the word is uh, what what is going to be used to generate each uh, each token here is um, not only the representation of the source that is contextualized this way, but also um, a representation of the partial uh, hypothesis that has been decoded so far. So let's say, for instance, that um, some words have been already uh, um, decoded. Uh, we are going to build some kind of representation of those um, uh, partial uh, hypotheses using, again, transformer blocks. And based on this uh, partial representation and also based on the input, we are going kind of to um, 
to use this, uh, this thing that is called uh, cross-attention, which will allow, based on a query that corresponds to the representation of the decoder, it is going to um, tell us on which part uh, of the source the model should uh, pay more attention, focus more. Uh, and based on this uh, representation, we, we are going to um, generate a probability, dis probability distribution over the uh, output vocabulary and, and, and predict what is the next word. So it is a very short introduction of those uh, encoder-decoder approaches that are used nowadays for neural machine translation. Uh, I mentioned token uh, as an as a input. So in my example, the token were words. And actually, you can use any kind of, uh, of um, tokenization of the input. So you could work at the character level as well. And people have, have been doing that. It's working well. But uh, from uh, the many experiments that people have, have done over the, the last years uh, for uh, neural machine translation, the best uh, representation you need is actually something in between uh, uh, in between characters and words, and these are basically subword units that are extracted using some statistical uh, statistical rules. And basically, you have some examples here uh, for uh, uh, Korean or, or English. So this is something in between words and characters. And uh, there are different ways to extract this, but the most popular one is is called byte pair encoding. And why we would we like to 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 do this is just because. Let's say that we focus on, on English as a target language. Uh, um, so there might be like 100,000 uh, different words uh, in English. And the size of the uh, output vocabulary will directly impact the size of the architecture of the network and its inference speed as well. Because uh, basically, you, you, if you have 100,000 different tokens uh, possible at the output, that means that the um, uh, output layers of the model will have this number of nodes, basically. Uh, and so if you basically have something that is in between using these uh, subword units, you can have uh, smaller vocabularies like uh, 16, 60,000 uh, tokens, uh, while still being able to cover all the language. And this is even more true if we are uh, moving to multilingual model where for which we we, we will share uh, the data among many, uh, many different languages. So how do we train such model? We are going to feed the architecture with a thousand or more, more generally hundred millions of, uh, of source target language uh, sentence pairs. Um, and basically the model will learn to predict uh, what comes next in the target language, so what is the next word, using uh, a view of the full source and a partial, uh, a partial um, target sequence. Uh, and from this prediction, we will derive uh, um, a, a training signal uh, in the form of a cross-entropy loss uh, in order to update the, the parameters. And of course, at inference, uh, we just have access to the source uh, uh, and we will make um, a prediction in, in a way that is most of the time called autoregressive. So the best model at the moment are, are making this de autoregressive decoding, which means that uh, each uh, word in the output will be generated uh, one after the other. And we will see later on that there are some issues with this uh, autoregressive decoding for related to inference speed. So now the real topic of my talk is multilingual uh, neural machine translation. So. Um, the idea uh, that was introduced in 2019 by a uh, Google, uh, Google scientist is to say, okay, could we train a single model uh, that would be able to uh, translate multiple sources and multiple t uh, from multiple sources into multiple target languages? And for for being able to do that, we would need to share a, a common vocabulary. Uh, um, so basically, that would be a vocabulary that might be common to all the languages and also common to different writing systems. If we have more uh, than one writing system in the, all the languages we want to, to cover. And so there is uh, data to train such system. This data is most of the time what we call English-centric, which means that you have English aligned with different languages like French, Italian, Spanish, German, Korean, in this example. Uh, but... Uh, we will see, uh, and generally it's, it's more difficult to, to find uh, non-English centric data, but we will see that uh, those multilingual models actually display an interesting property for translating between languages, language pairs that do not include English. 
And there is a trick also, we, we add a special uh, token on the source side uh, of the sentences to, to tell the model into which, uh, uh, into which uh, language it will have to, to translate. So, um, in this 2019 uh, paper by Google, it was first demonstrated that it's possible to train such system if you scale in terms of number of parameters. I think their first model was 400 million parameters. And you can actually have, yes, a single model that is able to translate between, uh, from multiple languages into multiple languages. But uh, what was interesting in this study as well is the fact that um, um, some interesting property was noticed, and this was called a zero-shot uh, uh, ability, which is the fact that, for instance, since this model is actually able to, uh, for instance, uh, encode French language into uh, Latin representation and also decode, for instance, into Korean from those Latin representations, basically those models display also uh, this zero-shot ability, for instance, to translate from French to Korean, even if those models have never seen any single um, pair of sentence uh, that is a translation from French to Korean. So this was a very interesting um, uh, um, feature of this uh, multilingual uh, neural machine translation system. So um, another f interesting feature of those of those models, uh, and it is uh, displayed here on the right. So uh, from this 2019 paper again is the fact that um, once you build those multilingual models, so the amount of data you have for the different languages is, is quite unbalanced. So for some languages that we can call high resource languages, you have a lot of data, and for, for some of them, you have much, much less. Uh, and those multilingual models display some kind of cross-lingual uh, um, ability. So basically, um, and this is shown here, so this black line is basically um, so we measure the performance in machine translation with a score that is called bleu. The higher, the better. There are many other metrics. Bleu is not the best metric you can imagine, but um, still it's a good proxy to know if, uh, if the system is good or not. And uh, basically here, if you represent he here uh, through this black line, um, a bilingual baseline, so a model that is trained only on bilingual data, so it can just translate one language pair. And if you compare its performance with a multilingual model, um, you see that for these low resource uh, conditions, uh, actually the multilingual model is better than the bilingual model, which means that there is some kind of cross-lingual um, uh, feature or cross-lingual uh, ability of the multilingual model to to help translating the, the lower resource languages. But in the meantime, as we can see here, um, the high resource, if you have like high resource language pairs, it's much better to train a bilingual model from, from this curve. Uh, and it was called the curse of multilinguality, basically. So multilinguality is good for low resource languages, but not so good for high resource languages. And of course, in production, you want to have the, the best system possible. But I mean, what they did, basically, uh, uh, again, in, in, um, in a later paper, was just to scale the model. So you see that here, this blue, uh, this model has 400 million parameters. What if we scale to 6 billion and even like 50 billion parameters? And uh, if you do that, basically, all the performance might, be, might go higher. Uh, so we, you could consider that you are happy with that, but the problem is that if you scale those models like with six or 50 billion parameters, they are going to be very slow at inference. So they are also very costly to train. I, I'm, we are working on this uh, um, training cost as well, but I'm going to talk only about inference speed uh, uh, for the remaining of this talk. So what can we do uh, with those multilingual models that are uh, quite good uh, for both low and high resource languages if we scale to many or to more than one billion parameters. But wh what can we do to, to make them maybe faster at inference? Um, and why we would, we would we like to do that? Uh, it's of course because we want better user experience. We want the model to, to translate fast, faster. And of course, if the inference is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is fast as well, uh, the energy consumption might be uh, might be a, a bit uh, a bit lower as well. So um, we propose two things. Um, first one is to um, 
really think about the architecture, the coder decoder architecture, and we are going to see with rather simple uh, adjustment, we, you, you can gain a lot in terms of inference speed. And the second thing will be about, um, uh, yes, training a very big model, but then compress it to make it smaller while keeping uh, most of the information it has learned. So um, first, uh, first contribution, is uh, about speak, spinning up the, the inference, and it's a work we, we presented last year at the MNLP conference. Uh, so first, we just did something uh, very simple, which is a benchmarking of those, uh, of those transformer uh, encoder-decoder models. So uh, what you have here is the time spent in different parts of the encoder-decoder architecture for a bilingual model and for a multilingual model with a bigger vocabulary because we need a bigger vocabulary to cover more, uh, more than two languages, basically. Um, we see that uh, the time spent in the encoder is quite neg negligible, whereas the time spent in the decoder is much bigger. And the reason is because when we um, uh, translate autoregressively, uh, each time we generate a new token, so our output sequence is changing, and basically, we need to re-encode the full sequence because those transformer representations are contextualized. So now that a new token has been um, has been put, has been, has been appended at the at the output, we need to re-encode everything. And this is very costly, especially if those sequences are are long, because uh, the complexity of the transformer is, is quadratic with uh, with the sequence length. So a lot of time is spent in the decoder, and. Um, also, uh, since we are scaling the vocabulary, for instance, from 16 to 64K, uh, then more time is spent also in, uh, uh, in this part called the, the, the BIM uh, um, decoding, where basically um, this is a decoding approach uh, in, uh, that we are using in order to investigate more hypotheses within the hypothesis space of the, of the, of the model. Um, so more time is spent there as well. So can, what, what can we do to reduce these two, uh, this, the time spent in these two, in these two components? Um, so for having a, a, a faster decoder, we are just going to have, with the same parameter budget, to uh, have a deeper encoder and shallower decoder. And we may also replace the transformer uh, architecture of the decoder by uh, RNN, which will not require this uh, uh, quadratic self-attention. And in order to reduce the, the size of the vocabulary, uh, still our model is multilingual, but when we have to translate at inference time, uh, we know into which language we want to translate. So knowing this target language, we might also on the fly reduce uh, the output vocabulary, and we call that vocabulary filtering. So just uh, an illustration of that. Uh, this is the baseline architecture we use, so 64K uh, vocabulary and six encoder and six decoder layers. So with the same budget, let's just uh, have a deeper encoder and shallower decoder. First uh, modification, a very simple one. And then let's also um, build some uh, target language specific vocabulary that will, be, that will be smaller. So these are very two simple updates on, uh, on, uh, on an initial model. Uh, so let me skip this one. So um, just for the vocabulary filtering, how do we do that? So we have a, a, a vocabulary that is initially covering all the languages covered by our, by our system. And let's say that now I want to, co to, to build, a, for instance, a German specific vocabulary. I'm just going to use all my German training data, uh, uh, tokenized or so segmented with, with uh, a shared uh, multilingual vocabulary and then collect some frequencies and keep maybe only uh, 8,000 tokens uh, and hopefully those tokens will be the most representative of the German language. And I, I can do that at test time, so no need of retraining the model itself. I can also retrain the model, but I'm not going to talk about it. Um, so we made experiment on uh, on, uh, on a test, so first we built a model with, uh, uh, with uh, many languages, so 20 languages actually, uh, so 400 language directions, uh, uh, which cover six language families and three different writing systems, and we evaluated on, uh, on a data set that has 380 uh, language directions. 
Uh, let's look at inference time first. So uh, this this is the time spent to uh, uh, to translate a, a full uh, a full uh, test or dev data set that we have. So here you have the baseline architecture with six encoder and six decoder layers, and just this super simple uh, modification with the same parameter budget. So moving from a deeper encoder. Uh, uh, greatly uh, increase the inference speed. We will see later on the, the performance, but basically you will see that the performance are similar, even better with this uh, deeper encoder model. Uh, then, uh, reducing the output vocabulary, uh, taking into account the fact that we know the target language, is also uh, a way to uh, decrease the time spent in the in the beam uh, beam decoding and in the computation of the soft max, which is a probability distribution over the the, the output vocabulary. And then also replacing the uh, transformer decoder by a RNN decoder uh, uh, was also a way to increase speed. So what about the performance? Uh, you still have the speed here on the left and now you have the performance. So we split the performance between uh, language pairs that have English uh, inside, uh, so translating from or into English. And these are 38 different language pairs, and we average the results of, over those language pairs. And also the language pairs that do not have English, and for obvious reasons, um, since the model has not necessarily seen those language pairs, the performance are quite, uh, quite uh, smaller in that case. And we still evaluate with this blue score here along the x-axis. Uh, so what we see is that uh, we can decrease, uh, uh, we can really reduce the speed while, uh, so, sorry, increase the speed while, uh, while keeping uh, um, some very similar performance with those different models. So um, this was the conclusion of this first, uh, first part, and I will then take five minutes for, for the last one. Uh, so just having this simple um, deeper encoder and shallower decoder uh, approach was a way to uh, obtain uh, faster and even better quality. Uh, this language-specific voc vocabulary filtering uh, improved the speed as well, and replacing the transformer decoder by a RNN is, leads to a very good speed blur trade-off as well. Uh, so let me just take five more minutes to uh, um, present uh, some work we have done with uh, uh, an intern uh, very recently, and this is something that is presented with this week at uh, the MNLP 2022 uh, conference. So we have seen that these very large uh, multilingual neural machine translation models are very appealing because they are uh, they have this. Uh, uh, so you have a single model uh, for many language pairs, uh, and also th they display this zero shot uh, uh, feature, which is very nice. Uh, and uh, also, uh, such a big models were released uh, recently. So you have heard about very big la uh, language models that were released recently, but this is also true for, for machine translation. For instance, Meta uh, released uh, uh, two years ago already this M2M100 model um, that is trained uh, uh, on massive amount of multilingual data. It has 12 billion parameters. and. Um, Basically, it, it covers 100 languages and in all directions, so this is 10,000 language pairs, and it has quite good performance on many of them. Uh, but again, uh, as it is big, this model is rather slow at inference. So um, the question we asked here was, okay, can we take benefit of this uh, very uh, good model uh, while compressing, in, compressing it or distilling it um, into an architecture which is much, uh, much smaller? So basically, we took this. Uh, so I mean, knowledge distillation uh, is very, uh, very simple in principle, but uh, quite uh, challenging to um, to to do because for for doing that, first you need to define the, uh, a target architecture for for the smaller model. You will that will be the, the student model, and so basically for that, what we did is that we used this uh, deep encoder, shallow decoder model I presented in the previous uh, contribution. Uh, you need training data as well. Uh, uh, we took uh, a very small, well, it's still huge, but we took like f uh, almost like 6% of the M2M100 uh, training data. Uh, so this, the, the training data that was used to train this huge 12 billion parameter model. So we took a, a subset of it and we tried to balance the data for all language pair as, as, uh, as much as it was possible. 
And uh, still, uh, it's, it's less costly. So knowledge distillation of such kind of big model is less costly than training the model from scratch. But you can see that you need compute as well. Uh, so for instance, the distillation was made uh, for, for one month using 16 V100 GPUs. And so how is it done? Um, so you have your, uh, your small architecture here. Uh, you have the teacher model, which is uh, the very large model here. And basically, uh, generally, uh, we use this composite loss uh, knowledge distillation, which is basically a, com uh, uh, a sum of uh, this loss that corresponds to just like um, fine tuning an existing model for solving the specific task. So, very conventional uh, loss that is using in, in machine translation. But in addition, we are using a loss that will um, be uh, uh, computed by comparing. Uh, the uh, softmax, so basically the probability distribution over all the uh, vocabulary. So this distribution made by uh, the model at, uh, at training time, it will be compared to the prediction made, made by the teacher model. And we want to make those, those distribution to be very similar. So we want the uh, small model to behave like the teacher model. So it has this composite uh, uh, loss. And so I'm not going to, um, to detail this very big table. So we made experiment with uh, on, one, on more than 1,000 language directions, and we had to aggregate all the results. But let me just summarize uh, this. So what we have seen uh, is that our model, uh, which has uh, something like uh, 400 million parameters, so um, to be compared with uh, 12 billion parameters for the teacher model. So this model. Uh, Basically, uh, first, it outperforms a uh, multilingual model of comparable sizes, uh, but uh, it's, it's really equivalent in performance to a, a, another model of the M2M100 family, which is 1.2 billion. So uh, still, yeah, our distilled model is not better than the 12 billion parameter model, but it's really equivalent in performance to the 1.2 billion parameter from Meta. Why being uh, uh, much faster and uh, uh, much smaller as well. So um, this work is presented this week, and we uh, we thought that it would be interesting to share the, the distilled model to the community. And since a few days, uh, it has been already downloaded uh, 500 times. So this is another way to obtain small uh, smaller models that are faster at inference, just just doing like compression from from very big uh, very big models. So I'm going to stop here. It's already uh, five. Yeah, thanks a lot. Hi, Laurent. Thank you for this clear presentation. It was interesting to see that uh, you improved uh, existing models. You, make, you made them faster. Uh, I was uh, expecting um, maybe more on how this solution is deployed in production, how it, uh, it scales up. And uh, I mean, yeah, you have this model. And now, how do you move it to production? How, uh, what, what are the use cases or the applications that use this? Uh, Translation. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, so again, we are like um, a research center of this Korean company. So, you, you have seen that we work closely with people that are nearer to the production. But at the moment, for instance, this uh, efficient architecture is the, 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 the fact that they put it in production is an ongoing process. It's not done yet. Uh, it's really, um, and what are the use cases uh, for, for, for translation? So first, there are like online translation services, such as any other services you can imagine, like Google Translate and others. But those, they really focus on, uh, on uh, um, trans language pairs that include uh, Korean and Japanese and Chinese. Uh, they really want to be very good on those language pairs that are maybe the most important one for their, for their users. 
And also there are many other, um, other use cases where translation can be useful. So for instance, this Papago uh, entity, um, they produce uh, apps that you can put on, on your iPhone that will do um, not only like, text translation, but image translation. So uh, for, for having like traveled in, into Korea in September, uh, I can tell that it's really useful to, to take a photo of a menu or, or, um, or, or a map and get, uh, get some translations uh, on your phone in order to, to know uh, about the Korean language and what, what, what it is talking about. And also some speech translation as well, so they are working on this use case as well. So this is mostly for, for users, but also they feel some uh, internal needs uh, for translation within the company as well. So the last question. <laughs> no, no, of course. Um, in fact, the search space is is, is huge. Uh, you can you can uh, don't know test uh, why not six, why not five, why not uh, decrease the uh, positional encoding, for example. Uh, the positional encoding is very large. So, so do we, do, do is there any any insight of uh, what what is the policy to to uh, to uh, to shape, in fact, the the, uh, uh, the encoder decoder. Mm -hmm. uh, you you see, you have seen <laughs> the methodology for us. It was really about benchmarking uh, because we so the focus was really on a task uh, on on the inference speed. So just doing some benchmarking and measuring precisely what is the time spent in each part of the architecture, and then act specific uh, specifically on this part of the architecture. And for, for instance, so you, reducing you, you, the complexity. You have been of the just decoder. lucky. You, you are just uh, lucky. No, just, just because we know that, for instance, for the decoder, if you make it smaller, uh, uh, automatically you will have a better inference speed because of the complexity of yeah, transformer. Sure. But, uh, uh, why is better? Sorry? Why, why is that better? Why, why to increase the encoder uh, uh, it's, capacity think, and decrease the decoder yeah, is I, better than just uh, keeping the balance? Well, what was uh, the intuition? I think, yeah, I think if you have a deeper encoder, uh, it's not only going to encode the language, but it's going to encode the language knowing what is the target, uh, um, what is the target language you should translate into. So this deeper encoder will probably do some already some part of the translation job, and then the decoder will just like uh, output the, the surface form uh, based on, based, on, based on those uh, internal representations. So. I mean, it makes sense, but first you need to benchmark to know on which part you need to you need to act. Thank you for the last question. Um, we we have to move on. We have. Merci, uh, merci encore, Laurent. So I invite you to move just outside of of uh, this room, and we have a very interesting uh, event happening now. <laughs>